at a uh, university in Switzerland in 1997. And then he uh, went for postdoctoral studies with, uh, at Stanford University, where he actually joined the Arabidopsis database project as the scientific curator. And then in 2003, he moved to Cornell in the laboratory of, uh, we know, the tomato, uh, Dr. Tansley, Professor Tansley, where he lead the Soil Genomics Network project, a major database for solanaceous plants and that includes tomato, potato, pepper, eggplant, and petunia. In 2008, he became a group leader at Boyce Thompson Institute for Plant Research, where he leads the bioinformatics group with the SGN database being a continued focus of his work. The database work focuses on the genotype, the phenotype problem of the crop, and of other solano, and its application, of course, to crop improvement. He has been involved in the tomato genome sequencing project since its uh, inception, and he's actually one of the 300 authors, of which is the uh, first author of the tomato genome sequencing uh, publication. Uh, uh, now he's uh, much involved uh, on many uh, database and sequencing genome project, not only in solanaceous but other plant families. So again, we have here. Uh, Dr. Lucas Mulier, our speaker, and we'll be talking on how the solanation genomes can be put to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be in the Philippines again. Um, I gave a seminar here in this room about two years ago. Some of you might have been here, some of you might remember. Um, I um, talked about some work in the, in the lab at that time, um, and I've really made an effort to talk about something new this time. So it, there won't be anything from the old uh, talk uh, in this presentation. Also, the title has changed, and I apologize for the title. It's not a very good title. But uh, what I mean to say with this title is that you know, it's not enough to sequence solanation genomes or any genome. You really have to also work with them. And um, I hope that's what we have done. Uh, for the past uh, couple of years. As you know, uh, in 2012, uh, the tomato genome paper came out and uh, tomato uh, officially joined the post-genome era. And now we have a new tool that uh, opens amazing new possibilities uh, to study uh, tomato genomes, wild genomes, variation in tomato, as well as uh, solanation for the and what we have, so in this publication, um, uh, we present the reference sequence for uh, Heinz 1706, um, the, the tomato reference sequence. But there was a second sequence in the paper, which was that of Solano which was a resequencing uh, sequence, um, which was aligned back uh, to the reference. And which was presented in the paper as the closest wild relative of tomato. Okay. So in the meantime, uh, we have actually done a lot more sequencing uh, in the lab, and, and of course a lot of people elsewhere. Um, last time I was here, I talked about our efforts to sequence uh, this GH13 breeder line, which uh, has a coronavirus uh, resistance gene and a novel resistance gene. And we, we looked at interpretations in that virus, uh, that plant, sorry, uh, and uh, we could identify the region where the, the resistance gene was located. And that resistance gene has, in the meantime, been cloned and then published, uh, which wasn't the case when I, uh, when I was talking, I think. Um, so we have gone on uh, and actually uh, sequenced, uh, you know, initiated new collaborations with, uh, with other breeders. Uh, such as Seth Hutton, and we sequence a large number of uh, introgressions in uh, tomato uh, germplasm. Uh, but I won't we'll talk about this today. Um, we also sequence uh, yellow pear heirloom line, uh, which is um, punitively an introgression free uh, line. As we will see, the reference sequence actually has some uh, introgressions in it. Uh, and so we, we felt we, it is important to really sequence a clean. Tomato line that's really selected by the person on, and not selected by the person on with uh, introgressions in it. And I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about this work. We also sequenced uh, Nicosiana Betamiana, which is an important model system, uh, especially for viral induced gene uh, expression studies. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about that in this talk. Uh, I'll also talk about another uh, solanation that we sequenced. Um, which is a wild tomato that grows on, uh, on the Gargalapagos Islands. Um, and I'll talk about this as well. 
Uh, and then we did a lot of other <laughs> sequences that we started or that are kind of we are still working on, such as Solaris Lens, which gives us a lot of problems to assemble, to be sure. Uh, and we are involved, you know, we collaborate with other people to sequence uh, other solar issues such as uh, Splatoon. So first, let me talk about uh, Solaris Lens. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, an interesting uh, uh, tomato. It is actually uh, an orange fruited tomato. Uh, this is the most striking feature. It has also a pretty different morphology from uh, a domesticated tomato. Uh, it has uh, pretty good salt and drought resistance, which, it, uh, which is the reason uh, for which it was used in, um, in breeding programs as well. Uh, and it has also uh, somewhat different, differently formed trichomes than uh, the domesticated tomato. And it grows on the Galapagos Islands, of course, which are famous for um, Charles Darwin having discovered basically the evolution there. Um, and uh, it grows in, in the coastal regions uh, of these islands where they're exposed to a lot of salt. And that's where uh, we think a lot of the salt resistance. So, when we look at the solanation uh, by phylogeny, or the, essentially the phylogeny of the wild tomatoes, uh, you will find a lot of publications that have you know, tried to figure this out. Um, for example, uh, in a 1993 reference, uh, like a persicum would be uh, uh, the closest relative of like a persicum would be Pimpinella folium, for example, as was presented in the nature paper. Folium is the closest uh, to, to like the first one. And then Chismania. And Chismania is very closely related to Galapagansi. Uh, they, they were actually considered the same uh, until about five years ago, then they were split, or maybe ten years ago now, and then they were split into, into two subspecies. Um, well, if you look at other, other data, uh, other trees that were published, uh, Chismania slash Galapagansi. Uh, are closer at Solana uh, Black Persicum than Pimpinella folium. Of course, all the others, uh, they are very definitely much further away from this group here. It's important to note that actually uh, Pimpinella folium uh, looks quite distinct from Black Persicum, but it, has, it looks more similar to Black Persicum than does Solana For example, it has red fruits, and also the leaves are, are different, but they are not as different. As the in my view, and I'm not involved in this, okay. <laughs> so we figured we can resequence Galapagansi and we can uh, tell for sure with the whole genome sequence that we had uh, of Pippinella folium, of Galapagansi, and of Michael Persicon, whether uh, which one was the most closely related. And so uh, our approach was to, to do uh, resequencing using the Illumina high seek. Uh, and we see that Solana Galapagansi as well as the yellow pair in this project. Uh, we then made a genome assembly based on alignments to the reference sequence and used that genome sequence uh, to do phylogenetic and, and other analysis. And so this work was uh, done by uh, Susie Strickler, who is also traveling here and uh, who, who gave most of the, of the bioinformatics course that some of you attended. Uh, yeah, she did most of, of this work, so I'm speaking of her behalf. So these were the initial results of, of the mappings. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy, <laughs> a busy figure, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll go through it uh, panel by panel. So this is uh, panel A, this is chromosome 4 uh, of the beta. We did, I didn't show all the chromosomes because that would be way too complicated or you know, too detailed. But you see here we have, uh, you probably can't read this, but uh, this is uh, the yellow pair sequence uh, mapped to the reference sequence of uh, Solana and Black Persicum. You see that there are relatively few differences here, except you know, you, we have one conspicuous peak here in chromosome 4, but otherwise it's fairly flat. So a few differences between yellow pair and 
seems to have, you know, subjectively maybe uh, in regions that definitely regions that have much higher peaks uh, than than the Sulawesi, but also definitely more than the Yellow uh, Bear. You can see that it has regions of lower uh, density, and it has this region here, very low density, that actually maps uh, to this region here, where the Yellow Pair has a pretty high degree of difference uh, with uh, the reference sequence. And so as we will show, see later that actually this region uh, is, uh, is a region where the reference sequence has an expression from Pippin Alphobic. That's why uh, there's no difference between Pippin Alphobic and the reference sequence in this one. It's not the case in these other regions here, actually. Um, then we have another chromosome that just shows you that you know this is uh, fairly uniform across the chromosomes. Uh, and again, you can show all the chromosomes. And here we show uh, the, the density of mapping. Obviously, you could say, well, here maybe we don't have any any sequence reads, nothing mapped here. But if you look at the density, that's actually not the case. They're just this was a region of lower uh, low, uh, low um, And here is the just as a, as a reference. So this is kind of our basic data to start from for our analysis. So an analysis that we did, we wanted to, to uh, derive the phylogeny of, uh, of these uh, different plants. And of course you need an outgroup. So uh, we chose the recently sequenced Solana tuberosum uh, as an outgroup. And we also used uh, another um, sequence that was obtained uh, in the same lab as Cipinella Folio uh, at Cold Spring Harbor uh, as a, a, an additional um, sequence in, in the analysis. And the first analysis that, um, that we did, and I always say we, but I really mean Susie, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's Susie. Um, we, we derived the coding sequences for all these genomes and we, uh, we made an analysis based on the coding sequences alone. And uh, the coding sequences, uh, you know, there's about 34,000 genes in tomato. And in these uh, um, derived coding sequences, we found about 9,000 orthogonous groups uh, that you could clearly align to each other, okay, that were clearly orthogonous. This, uh, this analysis is based on those orthogonous groups. So that might introduce a little bias, of course, because we can look at very many more closely related genes. But then we calculated phylogenetic trees um, for each gene group, and we classified the resulting tree by the tree topology. So what does this look like? And I hope you can see this from the back. Can you see this? Uh, otherwise, I'll just go through it. Uh, so these are actually the, the number of uh, topologies that we found for a certain uh, topology class. For example, uh, the first topology that we have, uh, like the Persicon and the Lapagensi, are the closest uh, neighbors in the tree. Right? So that, that, that if, you, if you receive that topology from your analysis, that means that Lapagensi is the, closest, the most closely related to like the Persicon. Then the next uh, topology, uh, is like the first column, it is the most closely to Pippinella folium. So obviously that means Pippinella folium is more closely related. In, uh, these genes look like Pippinella folium is more closely related than Galapagensi. Uh, then we also get some genes where Galapagensi is actually most closely related to Pippinella folium. But if you look at the abundances of these trees, and again, you know, these are the orthologous sets, so there might be a little bit of bias in uh, but if you look at, uh, at the abundances, clearly uh, the Galapagensi, like the first one, was the most abundant. Now, the, the presence of, uh, of these trees, uh, yeah, of these topologies is actually not too surprising uh, and has been observed in many other instances where, where people look at very closely related genomes. This phenomenon is, uh, is called incomplete image sorting. That, um, you know, that 
that, that is expected to occur if you analyze very closely related uh, genomes. So the other analysis that we did is a, uh, what I call genome partitioning, uh, where the whole genomes were aligned um, and then partitioned into fragments uh, according to some parameters so that each fragment would have sufficient information to classify uh, phylogenetically. So this is the entire genome. This is not only the, uh, the coding sequence, but everything. Right? Uh, then the aligned fragments were, were analyzed again uh, phylogenetically using a Bayesian method, uh, which is interesting because it gives you uh, probability for every tree, uh, every possible tree uh, in the set. Uh, so it's a probabilistic method. And then you can actually plot these probabilities by genome position. And you, for each genome position, you will see which uh, genome origin is most likely for that position. Okay? And so when we do that, uh, again, for chromosome 4 and 5, as we have seen before, uh, get this result, you see that um, these graphs are mostly one color. Um, so here on this axis we have the genome position uh, all of the chromosome from you know, 0 to uh, about, you know, a few megabases and here is the, the probability of it coming uh, from a certain topology, a certain tree. Right? And so the topologies that we have is you know, topology number 1 is uh, 1 and 2 are the most closely related. Right? Uh, in this analysis we also include a yellow pair and two is the reference sequence. So you would, you would of course assume that yellow pair and uh, like the first column would be the most closely related, but both like the first column, right? They're the same thing. Uh, followed by number three, which is the Lapagensi. So the Lapagensi in all this mass here is the most closely related to um, like the first column. You get some instances uh, here. Uh, where there is quite a large probability of topology 2 being uh, 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 you know, likely as well. About, you know, quite likely here and uh, about as likely as, as this topology. In this topology we have the Lapagansi uh, next to Pinter okay. So this is uh, a group that we have already seen in the other, uh, other analysis. Now what's interesting here is that we have one topology that is very dominant in this area here. Uh, that's uh, topology number six. And in topology number six we have one YP being the closest to Galapagensi, right? Number three. Uh, and that is very strange. So number number uh, two is out here and groups really with Pippin and Phonium. So in that region, like a Persicon, the like a Persicon reference is closer to Pimpinella folium, and yellow pair is closer to Galapagensi. So that means that it's very, very good evidence that this uh, is an introgression in the reference sequence. And that's also 100% certain, as you see. I mean, this is really, uh, really is very, very clear. So another um, analysis that we did is we looked at selection, and selection is interesting because you have these different lines, and um, if you look at, uh, at selection, which means that we have new mutations in genes that might be uh, conveying an evolutionary advantage, uh, that these could be related to domestication of like persicon or to adaptation of Galapagansi. Uh, and these genes will be kind of interesting to know about, right? For example, if you want to find out about salt resistance, then you, you, you could identify the salt resistance genes like that, because they have evolved uh, uh, more than other genes. Um, you, you can identify them uh, with these approaches possible. And so the way to estimate that, obviously, you know, everything mutates at a certain rate, so it's very hard to say, uh, are these are the, is this uh, evidence for selection? <clears throat> so, some methods have been developed uh, where you use uh, the ratio between synonymous mutations, which are uh, in, in these models usually considered to be silent, 
to selection, which they are not in practice not always are, but uh, here they are considered to be uh, um, silent uh, to, to, uh, or invisible to selection, uh, versus the, the non synonymous selection. And uh, the program that was used is, uh, is Panel. And uh, we analyzed uh, this um, data set and found about 25 genes that have evidence of, of selection. Now, actually we don't know what most of these genes do, um, so they might be interesting to look at more closely. Um, some seem to be related to uh, disease resistance. Uh, disease resistance genes are genes that undergo very, uh, you know, very rapid selection. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, a, a good positive control that we get in some of these genes in the chat set as well. But the question is, you know, how statistically significant are these results? And uh, more data and maybe other methods uh, might be used in the future to, uh, to do this analysis to get a slightly more, uh, maybe a statistically more rigorous, uh, rigorous way. So the conclusions from this part of the work is uh, that uh, we, uh, we see that God and it is more closely related uh, to some other like person on the map, if you know, uh, we see definitely evidence of so-called incomplete linear sorting, which uh, is often seen uh, in recently evolved species, uh, and where heterogeneous uh, founded populations were present. So large variation in, in the populations. And I also want to point out that we just did one accession of Pimpinellifolium and one accession of Galapagansi. These are very uh, diverse species, so if you would take two different accessions, uh, maybe you would get a different result. We can't exclude that. And uh, Professor uh, Blanca from the University of Valencia uh, criticizes our work uh, and says that um, you know, we should analyze more Pimpinellifolium uh, to make sure that this is actually true. Uh, and I think he's right, and he has a, identified a special population of Pimpinella folio that he believes is closer to a like person. So um, we'll work with him and probably sequence that accession and um, see what comes out. So what we need to do is basically, you know, really assess the diversity you can go up against in a Pimpinella folio more than with just one single accession. So with that, I want to switch to our Benthamiana work. Um, the Catana Benthamiana is a really important model plant. Um, and probably many of you here use it um, for, for doing the base uh, assays. Um, its origin is actually, it's actually an Australian plant, and um, it's an allotetrapoid. Um, it's interesting that I think there's some evidence that in Australia, this plant was also smoked. So it's in the back. Um, it's been really, really becoming uh, an important model. And if you look at publications uh, that have the word Nicotiana Benthamiana in them, uh, it, you know, it's a steeply increasing curve, right? And this is not this is not sequencing data for once. This is this is citations of the word Nicotiana Benthamiana in the literature. And this stops at 2011 uh, mid-year. Um, when the graph is made, but of course this, uh, I would expect this to be uh, growing at the same exponential rate uh, in the past couple of years as well. So Nicotiana is actually a very interesting genus. Uh, it has actually a lot of uh, tetrapoid species, and I think Nicotiana is a real model for tetrapoidization. Of course you have Nicotiana tobacco, which is a tetrapoid, which is a very, very large genome. Genome size varies widely in, 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 uh, in Christiana. You know, there is uh, you know, rest from, you know, a gigabase to uh, over six gigabases. Uh, it has 76 naturally occurring species. Uh, and um, of course, you know, the, the chromosome number varies obviously with tetrapolization and hexapolization uh, quite considerably as well. But a lot of them are actually allo, allo 
complex plants and starts to multiply and starts to generate double stranded sequence uh, RNA sequence. This uh, RNA sequence is uh, recognized by a, a, a protein or an enzyme called Dicer. And Dicer would actually cut this uh, into little pieces of about 20 to 25 base pairs. Um, this double stranded DNA will then be separated single stranded pieces. And one of the single stranded pieces is thrown away, I don't know what happens to it, but the other one ends up as a uh, kind of recognition molecule on a complex called RISC um, for RNA, oh, I don't know what it stands for. But it's, it's, a, it's a complex that will recognize other DNA, uh, sorry, other RNA molecules that are in the cell that match this fragment and it will uh, digest them and uh, prevent the gene from being, uh, from being expressed. So obviously that's a very, very, if you use that as a, you know, it's very, very effective against um, viruses uh, for the plant, but of course you can use it as a very uh, powerful tool to um, silence any, any gene uh, in the plant genome. This is how the base protocol in practice works. Um, you basically, uh, for example, you can use a CDNA library or a candidate gene. You clone it into a special binary vector that is available in the research community. Uh, you put that in an agrobacterium. The agrobacterium is then infiltrated into the plant and that expresses the viral genes and the viral, a virus will spread uh, through the plant and uh, silencing will occur through that mechanism that I just then you can absorb the phenotype. So the question is, you know, your candidate genes are random CNAs. What is the specificity of the silence genes? And that's that's really what the mixed tool is designed to address. So the mixed tool then um, really does the same thing as the cell does. Um, so if you give it a piece of DNA, it will actually kind of digest it into into uh, N bur and the N. Now, N, of course, is, is a user settable value. Uh, by default, it's 21. Uh, and it will map uh, all these 21 bars against uh, the target genome, usually um, the coding sequences of the genome. Uh, for example, you can, you can use Benamiana, but of course, you can do that with any genome that is available. And, and uh, a lot of people you know, want to apply this technology to the human species, so they are all present. Uh, then these uh, bow tie results are parsed, uh, and a number of targets is uh, evaluated uh, by, by the tool. Uh, for example, if you put a gene in um, Bentamiana, you would expect that it would at, at least silence two genes, right? Because it's a tetraploid. So you will have two uh, homologous uh, genes that are very similar, and it is quite likely that both will figures out this number. So if it were a large gene family with very similar genes, um, the number of targets would probably be set to a higher number. But it will calculate, it has some internal scoring that it uses, and uh, it will determine uh, the best window uh, of sequence to use as a probe uh, or as a, as a, uh, as a construct. Of course, you can then you know, refine your, your findings. Uh, it, it prints out a nice web page that's very uh, dynamic and you can zoom around. And you can, you can change, for example, the fragment size, or you can change the number of targets, and it will automatically recompute all of it. So, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the input page. You can paste any sequence in it. You can set some of the parameters. An inverse size of 21, uh, a fragment length that you want to use, uh, and how many mismatches you accept. You can select the database, and then it will uh, do all the mapping, and it will give you all the genes uh, or the presence of the 21 verse in all the genes uh, in the graphical overview. And it will decide that, for example, in this case, uh, this is a Benamiana. Uh, target database. So, so here we see 
that typically uh, will match very well to two genes because it's a tetrapoid, right? So it said this, uh, these blue genes are the so-called targets, and the red genes uh, are the so-called off-targets. And it will now try to maximize the overlap of 21 words with the targets and minimize the overlap with the off-targets. Then it calculates some score and it uses that score to calculate that region. And it puts it here it suggests that region here as the best region. Now we could also use the region here, but you see that there are fewer 21 words here uh, than here. And here you can't do it because you have too many off targets. So this is just a, a zoom in of this uh, interface. So we have the, the, the length of the query. Have the target and see this is now a tomato example, so you essentially have just one target, but aligns it was probably a tomato gene because it aligns perfectly. And you see the off targets in the other genes, and you can select that region uh, here. You can also have another view where this is kind of a collapsed view that shows you just the coverage uh, of. Uh, of 21 verse, but here in this uh, uh, non-collapsed view, you can see each individual 21 verb uh, that was aligned, uh, which is a kind of a nice way to look at it, but it's fundamentally the same, uh, the same view. So if you zoom out of the page, you know, we looked at this, but it will actually give you the action sequence that this corresponds to. And it will uh, highlight the sequence in the context of the sequence copy and paste the sequence and uh, use it for your uh, for your So <clears throat> since uh, since the VIX tool, uh, Noah has actually also worked on a tomato expression viewer that is not uh, on the site yet, but uh, it's coming together really nicely. Uh, you can enter a gene, it will give you the expression of the gene, it will give you uh, graphical overviews of tissues where the gene is expressed and exactly where it's expressed uh, it gives you uh, correlation information so this is your reference gene and these are genes that are, have similar expression levels to your genes and you can zoom into all this uh, data uh, all graphically and with a nice description so with that I think uh, I thought I'd give a live demo of too, but I think I'll skip this <laughs> uh, and I'll skip to the acknowledgements. Uh, this is uh, the lab and BTI. You uh, see uh, Susie, uh, who is also here, but she asked me not to point in her direction. <laughs> um, uh, who has a role for the Galapiensi? Aure, who I think I forgot to point out, he was really behind the Christiana uh, genome scene. Uh, and so many other things. Uh, he's uh, amazing, and he just started a new job at uh, Virginia Tech as a, as a faculty there. Uh, and Noe has, uh, has created the big tool and is working with the tomato expression paper. That's, that's pretty much it.
first disease resistance gene was supposed to be cloned from, from tomato. So I think tomato is a very you know, obvious target for, for the early sequencing projects. Uh, so that's the reason. Uh, maybe these genes from my uh, friends. Uh, you can basically make that, uh, I mean by that is that you see, for example, you, you study uh, banana because uh, there's a danger that they will be extinct uh, because most of them are really. Uh, is that the case with the way you know, uh, why, you, why do you want, uh, why are you interested in this gene? I, I have trouble with hear, just hearing you. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, what is the, what's the, any serious problem with the tomato? Is it in the danger of being extinct by a particular virus? Oh, like the yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, for example, the, the, the topic I talked about last time is, is a fairly pressing problem. It's the uh, coronavirus that uh, are really decimating uh, you know, tomato yields, uh, particularly in tropical countries. Uh, it's not as much of a But the coronavirus is a very, very severe problem in the uh, So there are, you know, always new diseases cropping up. Uh, and, and tomatoes certainly has a very, very large share of uh, susceptibilities. Uh, so that's, that's one important reason why to do it. But I think this, there's also the science, you know, this is kind of more applied reason, but there's also the scientific reason that we just understand. We did a lot of work with the label, uh, studied uh, food life in the label. It's very well understood. Uh, so people invest more in that system because uh, there's a good basis to discover more.
Thank you. 